Okay, not everybody is in, but I think we will start anyway. I will start by introducing the creative dialogue to this uh, session number four, which is entitled The Science of Creativity. And as we've heard from Mark Krunko, this science has uh, taken very long steps in the last 25 years. Now this uh, is a dialogue between Federico Fagin, he's a Marconi fellow, accredited with the invention of nothing less but the microprocessor. Federico is also an entrepreneur. He started a large number of new enterprises, startups, many of which are successful. So not only new ideas, but implementation of those ideas and business out of ideas. So exploitation as a part of the overall creative process. So Federico will be discussing with the 2013 young scholars from the Marconi Society. There are three, three young scholars. We have K. Wang, Dominique Laveri, and Salvatore Campione. K. Wang is uh, a PhD at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Salvatore is working on his PhD at the University of California, Irvine, and Dominique uh, at the University College of London, a research associate there. And they have all achieved uh, very significant results at a young age. Actually, one of the requisites for the young scholars is to be less than 27 years old, because Marconi at that time was already an entrepreneur, and a successful entrepreneur. He did most of the very important experiments that we uh, admire him for. So I will leave the floor to Federico to lead this discussion. Thank you very much. Grazie Giovanni. Uh, good morning. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here today with you and to uh, uh, discuss a little bit about my experience with creativity and then we're going to hear some of the creative stories from uh, our uh, young scholars. Well, they are the 2013 recipients of the um, uh, Marconi Young Scholar Award. I'm personally not a scholar uh, of creativity. I'm a practitioner of creativity. And uh, uh, what I would like to discuss with you and talk to you about is my one of the most unusual experiences that I had about creating a new product, an experience that I had at, the, at some point um, in the history of uh, my third company, Synaptics. So we had to go back about 20 years ago. And uh, Synaptics started in 1986, and at that time we wanted to create the hardware for um, intelligent systems using neural networks, artificial neural networks. And we made some major uh, uh, contributions, but really we couldn't go we couldn't find an architecture that was general purpose enough to be able to have a microprocessor kind of device for learning systems. So we had to uh, decide, I had to decide what kind of product we're going to do since uh, the original direction was not, going, was not panning out. So what I did was to get together the uh, best, the most creative uh, engineers that I had at that time. So we had five, uh, we were about 12 people at that time in the company. And so I took five of, of them, very smart and very creative young, young men. And uh, we decided to uh, go through a process of inventing together the product for the company. So we would meet twice a week, once or twice a week. Uh, and I gave an assignment. Of course, to, to decide what to do takes a lot of creativity too. And uh, what I had identified was that in the, in the uh, personal computers, the portable personal computers of that day, people were using a trackball. Some of you may remember that it was a trackball. And that trackball was really too bulky. Uh, and also, it would gum up because uh, the grease of the hands would, uh, you know, would make the little wheels slip, and uh, it needed constant cleaning, and uh, it was just not a good device. And so I recognized that as an opportunity. So I told my engineers, like, let's figure out a way 
to do a solid state solution to this problem. And uh, uh, so we went through, you know, in a, through a brainstorming creative process where by, and I was guiding the process, and, the, and it's, it takes a lot of skill actually to guide a creative process because the last thing that you have to do, that you should do, is say no to any idea, no matter how stupid it might look like, you know. You have to absolutely accept anything and uh, go with the flow and guide the process gently. Uh, and through that process, uh, it, took, it took about a month, we came up with the touchpad and the touch screens, which now are used everywhere uh, uh, in the mobile devices. That was all done in a month. The basic ideas, the, the, you know, the basic idea, but also how we would make them and so on. So it wasn't just, uh, you know, the idea. It was, it was, it was, uh, there was a sensible level of validation of that idea. But after that, it was just doing it. Um, so today, for example, Z uh, Synaptics, which is uh, the company where this was done, last quarter, they did uh, uh, $230 million of sales or revenues. Uh, with a uh, net profit of $45 million. So that's you know, almost a billion dollar company based on an idea that took one month to be developed. So that's, uh, that's a uh, wonderful result for that. Um, anyway, so uh, this, this is a story where basically there is not a single inventor. We were all inventors in that room. In fact, uh, eight patents came out of that work. Uh, uh, with different, different names depending on the contributions that we all did. Um, so, you know, it's one example where the group is the inventor, it's not one person. And uh, very often one thinks of creativity as the, in, in individual kind of uh, uh, effort, but really even more powerful is the creativity of a group when the energies and uh, intelligence and intuition of the group is harnessed properly. So with, with that, I want to uh, uh, give the words to our uh, young scholars, starting with uh, Salvatore Campione and his thoughts about creativity. Thank you very much for being here. So my name is Salvatore Campione, and I am a PhD student at the University of California, Irvine. Um, I am an electrical engineer, so ob obviously I'm not an expert of creativity, but um, I can try to give you my insight of how I apply my work to creative things. So my work entails the application of electromagnetics to nanostructures, nanophotonics, and metamaterials. Um, so we can use this work, the work I'm doing, for many applications to, for the need of, um, for example, improving um, human life. Um, for example, one of the most known um, applications that my work can lead to is the invisibility clock. Um, you, are, you might have seen this invisibility clock in the Harry Potter series, right? Uh, where a person can disappear whenever he wants and whenever he, he needs to, uh, to cover himself. Of course, we are not able to cover yet a human being, but we are able to cover colors. So for this reason, we can, for example, uh, cover an object from a radar, with a, uh, from a radar in, um, inspection. And that's already a good, a good um, objective, but of course, maybe in 20 years, we will be able to have a human body to be covered and, be, and disappear, you know, so who knows. Also, another experience that I want to give is that in my school, um, there are many professors that try to, and ask to their graduate students, to be creative and to be inventive. However, even if we try as individuals or as teams to provide creative ideas, we all, when we go to the advisors, we always get a no as an answer. Um, and this goes to what uh, Dr. Fajin said. Um, when, at the, you know, when at the top there is somebody that always says no, um, no matter how creative you are, everything is blocked. You know, there is a, some boxes that you are placing to, to your students. And when they grow up and they become mentors themselves, they will have those boxes. How do you come out of those boxes? Uh, that's why I think no is a wrong word, <laughs> you know? Um, so with that, uh, um, I leave the word to my colleagues. 
Okay, so um, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here, obviously. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to share my observations in the, in the context of some of the things that we heard yesterday and also um, I've read a couple of the abstracts from the session coming up. It all looks very interesting. So in that context, um, I'd like to mention something that came up in one of the talks. I think it was just a passing comment, um, and it's probably quite well known in the psychology field. It's a result from uh, Alt Schiller, possibly I said that right. Um, he said that 99% of inventions use a known solution or principle. Um, and so this got me thinking. I've never come across this principle before, but I'm familiar with maybe 80 to 90% of my field. And uh, if 99% of solution, uh, solutions use a known principle, then um, I should, it's just quick maths, be able to produce 80 to 90% of my ideas being good innovations. And that's clearly not the case. I don't think anybody's quite that creative. Um, and so last night I went back and had a look at what it was that he actually said in detail, or in some detail. And he says uh, the user known innovations use a known solution or principle from other fields. And my experience of other fields is less than 80 or 90 percent. <laughs> I won't say exactly what the percentage is, but it's significantly lower. Um, so this is definitely true in my field of research, which is optical networks. Um, as Sir David Payne was saying this morning, until um, he invented the fiber amplifier uh, along with his colleagues, um, there was a whole body of <coughs> the whole body of research looking at improving uh, transmission over single strands of optical fibers. Um, and now, 30 years later, we realize that what we actually want to do in optical networks is go back to some of that original literature and uh, essentially uh, hand cherry pick the, the best results that people had spent so many years working on um, in order to enhance our optical communication systems further. But we've done more than that. We've also looked at the work that was done in um, wireless communications, so Wi-Fi, for example. They were years ahead of us, and we've taken all that information um, that they, all those results that they derived, um, and we're using them. But creativity can come from the strangest places, and now we're looking at using um, algorithms from the field of machine learning, um, which I guess is is very related to psychology in, in a certain respect, um, in order to improve our ability to receive optical signals. Uh, and this is very strange. And so, so that, was, that was my first observation. Um, so in the context of the talks that are, that are coming up, um, two of the talks resonated with me. One of them is to do with openness and new ideas and creativity. Um, they, they are investigating to see whether or not there's a correlation between uh, an openness to new ideas and suggestions and uh, a creativity, creativity as a person, although the results are to, to be presented here. Uh, they're not in the abstract, so perhaps they will find a negative correlation. I, I, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> the, other, um, the other talk was, is that, that resonated with me is to do with groups so, and uh, the individual dichotomy. And so um, certainly within my group, we've been taking on lots of new members recently, almost one a week over the last year. But our innovation, ha our total output hasn't actually, uh, our, our creativity hasn't increased. And so it's interesting to know whether or not um, work as a group um, or work as an individual is the better way forward and how those two interplay. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there, but those are my interests there. Okay, thanks. And um, I'm K1 coming from the University of Melbourne. And um, well, we all know that creativity is quite an important thing. And um, as uh, Salvatore just uh, said, well, I'm not an expert. But uh, so here I just want to share some of uh, my experience in doing research in my field. Well, in my mind, I th would say the one of the most important thing of uh, becoming uh, so-called creative is actually thinking about what people want in their daily lives what is uh, uh, already available to them, and what are the limitations of these options, and whether there are some other options. Well, take myself as an example. Well, I'm, uh, when I first did my research, I just uh, realized that people always want high-speed wireless connectivities in their personal spaces, such as uh, at homes or inside offices. And uh, we all use Wi-Fi uh, these days, but uh, sometimes we realize Wi-Fi is so slow, we want higher speed. So I searched for, well, 
whether there is some way we can achieve higher speed because people need it. So I, s I searched for that and found that millimeter wave can do that. But uh, then I think, think about what is the limitation about millimeter wave. And I realized that it is quite difficult to distribute millimeter wave signal to different personal areas because millimeter wave cannot penetrate any physical blockings. And another thing is actually millimeter wave behaves quite similar with the optical signal because it's used a high frequency. So in this case, why not go for optical signal directly for the wireless connectivity to, uh, to in personal spaces? So I started my research in this area and found it, it's really interesting. And uh, another thing I think uh, that would help us to be creative is actually we need to know about what uh, are the limitations of the research we have already done. Well, um, the possible solutions of these uh, limitations may come from learning from other research areas or we may uh, get it from uh, discussion with other people. Well, we have heard a lot about the group uh, creativity and I would say it is really important. And finally, I would like to say that in order to be creative, I think we need to be have, uh, we need to have confident, confidence in ourselves and tr try to think from different perspectives. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much to the young generations. And uh, when we were discussing with Mark, uh, Mark Runko, the topic of his uh, keynote, one of the possibilities was the influence of geography in creativity. That means why new ideas come more often from some parts of the world, not other parts of the world. So my question to Federico is, in one minute, tell us what the Silicon Valley really is. <laughs> Well, um, Silicon Valley is probably the most creative uh, environment uh, on Earth at this point, as far as high technology is concerned. And the reason is because uh, Americans are in a minority in Silicon Valley. In other words, the people, they make up, not because Americans are not creative, <laughs> but because create, to sustain the high level of creativity, that exist in Silicon Valley, you need people from a variety of cultures that bring different perspectives. Uh, they bring also the motivation to create because crea you know, creativity is not just about having an idea, but you know, that idea then has to be made to work. Uh, that's what innovation is about, or you know, into, an innov into an invention and so on, like we heard this morning. So Silicon Valley um, uh, is, unique in the sense that it has, for since uh, essentially uh, Fairchild, which was the beginning of the semiconductor revolution of microelectronics, has been at the forefront of technology in all the successive waves of technology, technological innovation that have occurred. So, like if you, if you go into other parts of the states uh, where Pittsburgh was the, you know, was the steel capital of the world, you know, a, a while back, and then they, you know, they didn't innovate any, anymore. Basically, it became a steel town. And then it died with the steel. And the same as Detroit for the car industry. And it never innovated again. Silicon Valley continues to innovate. Uh, and that goes to the credit on this diversity that exists in Silicon Valley. Thank you very much. And when you go there, you feel the electricity in the air. One more question, then we will start the session, please. Whereas in Pittsburgh or the established East Coast, the penalty for making a mistake and being wrong is much higher. Uh, that, that's absolutely correct. Uh, and it shows the importance of creativity and the environment, right? The, you know, the environment being accepting or non-accepting or failure. And certainly in Italy also, there is a general tendency to, to be you know, chastising for people that fail, uh, and that does not, does not support a creative environment. Okay, thanks again. Yeah. Like to thank you. We will start the session by posing a very important question. You've seen creativity from many, many facets now. You see that there's many elements to that, many dimensions. 
is it possible to defragment this field and bring it to view? That is uh, the topic of the speech by Beth Hennessy. She's a professor of psychology at Wellesley College in the USA and a visiting professor at MIT, working with engineers and architects, trying to motivate and creativity in the classroom. So Beth, please, you have the floor. Good morning. No? <laughs> right there. Okay. In 2010, my colleague Teresa Mabale and I published a comprehensive review of the creativity research literature. We did that in the annual review of psychology. We started out by polling 21 eminent colleagues, all prolific researchers and theorists, and we asked that they nominate up to 10 papers published since about the year 2000 that they considered to be must-have references. We thought this was a great idea. Rather than fall prey to our own potential biases, we would rely on the consensus of experts. To our surprise, consensus was not to be had in any way. This exercise did nothing more than to add to our confusion. Our poll yielded 110 suggestions of specific journal articles, book chapters, books, or entire volumes of a journal devoted to a particular topic. Of the 110 nominated references, only seven, only seven were suggested by two colleagues, and only one was suggested by three colleagues. Rather than make our job easier, the exercise only served to underscore for us the marked diversity of opinion and overall fragmentation of our field. If we hadn't realized it already, the message that was driven home by our work on this project was that there's been a virtual explosion of the creativity literature, of topics, perspectives, and methodologies. And that's something that Mark talked about earlier. Yet our careful scrutiny of the literature showed that few, if any, really big questions were being pursued by a critical mass of researchers. In many respects, the scholarly understanding of the psychology of creativity has grown amazingly sophisticated, and contemporary researchers now bring to the table an ever-expanding variety of research and analysis methodologies. They have incredible disciplinary and cross-disciplinary training and backgrounds. The problem, however, is that investigators in one subfield often seem entirely unaware of advances in another. Many creativity researchers, like ourselves, were trained as experimentalists, systematically manipulating one or two variables at a time and making every effort to keep all other factors constant. This is the tried and true scientific method, after all. Yet some experimentalists have become so focused on the minute details of a specific situation or a specific participant cohort that they fail to see the bigger picture. As a result, creativity research is often carried out in only one level of analysis. For instance, they look only at the group or only at the individual. And they think only within one discipline or subfield at a time. In its final form, the message of our 2010 annual review paper was that researchers and theorists must now work to develop a systems view of creativity. As we wrote, the whole of the creative process must be seen as much more than a simple sum of its parts. Creativity must be operationalized as the result of a system of interrelated forces operating at multiple levels and requiring interdisciplinary investigation. Okay, so that sounds really good. And since the publication of our review, this call for a defragmentation of our field has in fact by, been echoed by a variety of investigators and theorists. Many of my colleagues appear to agree that an integration of the creativity literature is long overdue. 
and some of the important work being shared here in Bologna, most especially Christina Dorniak Wall's presentation, which will directly follow this one, is directed toward that goal. I think I speak for the entire creativity research community when I say it would feel really good, really good, like we had accomplished a lot if we could actually construct what appear to be useful system approaches, or dare I suggest, one all-encompassing systems model. Wouldn't most of us say that the construction of an all-encompassing model would serve as an impetus for future research and would assist us in forming hypotheses and coordinating research efforts? In our view, it makes good sense to continue working in this direction. This is the course of action that's generally taken in any scientific domain. However, in, in this conference paper, we want to add our concern that for this work, we don't want to lead to a wholesale reduction of the field. We engage in the research not for research's sake, but in order to better understand how to promote creativity, how to grow creativity. And when we remind ourselves of that real-world focus, we come away questioning whether any so-called systems model or grand theory will do much to guide us in applied settings. What would a truly integrative systems model consist of? How can we construct an integrated model that captures the highly complex system of interrelated forces operating at multiple levels to produce creative outcomes? Does it at all make sense to ask researchers and theorists to work to construct a systems model that simultaneously accounts for so-called big C creativity, Einstein-level creativity, pro-C creativity, the creativity of R&D developers working on the next big thing, little c and even mini c everyday creativity? Maybe this isn't a realistic goal. Maybe it's not even an important goal. Or another question, should both trait, meaning personality and intelligence factors, and state, situation-specific measures of creativity, be included in one overarching model? Could one model adequately capture the creativity of children as well as the creativity of adults, both experts in their field and novices? And would it make sense to incorporate into our model data collected worldwide, or would multiple models be necessary to account for demographic and geographic distinctions? If we are to subscribe to some research, recent research showing creative performance to be primarily domain specific, and there's a lot of evidence for that claim, as opposed to being across domains, Shouldn't even the most integrative model of creative behavior also focus perhaps on one area of creativity at a time, one area of expertise? In our own work, we're both theoretical and applied. For example, we've theorized about how intrinsic and extrinsic motivation affect creativity, and we've used this theory to assess how motivation impacts actual creativity in classrooms in several different cultures. Any consolidation of the scholarship on creativity must be driven in large part by the question of how best to serve real world constituencies. Those seeking to defragment the field have already encountered a number of in inevitable forks in the road. Over time, they may conclude that it's impossible to construct a single systems model that applies across cultures and situations and serves equally well to inform school administrators and curriculum developers, scientists and engineers in the laboratory, and R&D team members and their managers in the workplace. They may discover that they need to construct multiple complementary models rather than a single unified systems model of creativity. And wouldn't that be okay? Will the efforts of those working towards an all-encompassing systems approach have been in vain? John Baer, in 2011, published an especially, in my opinion, thoughtful paper 
entitled Why Grand Theories of Creativity Distort, Distract, and Disappoint. It's Bear's contention that we will never succeed in constructing an all-inclusive systems approach, an all-inclusive uh, grand theory. Bear well understands the appeal of such an approach. Look at what it's done, for example, for the study of particle physics. But he cautions that it's unlikely that any one theory or model will ever adequately capture, as he puts, puts it, the many very different kinds of cognitive and behavioral processes that underline creativity in diverse domains. And trying to force such a theory is bound to distort both theory and practice and lead to more misunderstandings than worthwhile breakthroughs. In an effort to make the problems inherent in system model building more concrete, I'm going to show you a few pictures. For many years, this three-part rubric, the creative intersection, first proposed by Teresa Mobley in the early 80s, guided much of my own work. Then slowly, Teresa, myself, and others began to build upon this conceptualization with the addition of other components. In this next model, offered by Teresa in the mid-90s, cognitive components and feedback loops involved in the creative process were added to the original three-part rubric. As would be expected, the complexity of models like this one is considerably greater than that of Teresa's original three-part Componential conceptualization, which in fact that earlier model was really only a metaphor rather than an accurate portrayal of causal pathways. Any theoretical fr framework or any working model will likely increase in complexity as more is learned about the phenomena under study, as our understandings become increasingly nuanced. But what about a consideration of individual difference in personality variables? cognitive developmental stages, the role of society in historical time and place, cultural and cross-cultural considerations, and the list goes on. In our inner review paper, Teresa and I argued that researchers must realize that creativity arises through a system of interrelated forces operating at multiple levels and often requiring interdisciplinary investigation. We offered a simplified schematic of the major levels at which these forces operate. I say simplified because, of course, even the existing research does cross levels. But what real benefits of such a systems approach, what will they bring to the teachers of New York City or Bologna or Shanghai? Or how about those so-called managers for innovation in LA, Rio, or Warsaw? Theories and models offer a manageable framework with which to better understand human behavior. They serve as an impetus for future research, and they assist researchers in forming hypotheses to be tested. And there are already a handful of systems perspectives out there, models that have done much to help us to organize our thinking and move forward in our research. For example, Csikszentmihalyi's 2006 framework explores how creative endeavor emerges within a social field. And Vlad Glavino's 2010 work, Vlad will be presenting in a few minutes, his work on creativity as cultural participation incorporates a three-way focus on creator, audience, and existing artifacts. We definitely appreciate the good work this kind of good work, and we sincerely hope that it continues. But we wonder whether a systems view will bring us any closer to the successful application of research findings and theories in real-world settings. If we were to work to develop and then apply a multifaceted systems model to real-world problems and settings, we would run the risk, we believe, of hopelessly complicating already highly complex situations. Chances are good that practitioners, managers, teachers, trainers, would become literally paralyzed, unable to decide what to do, what to fix first. By definition, applied work must involve a step back from the level of abstraction adopted in a core theory. Only in this way 
can the theory and the research findings it has generated throw light on specific creative challenges and situations? To our knowledge, there's not been much writing or theorizing done on the issue of applied creativity work. But there is a broad literature in the area of applied economics. And the scholarship in that area may well serve to illuminate the path that we as researchers in the field of creativity might opt to take. In the economics literature, a sharp conceptual distinction is drawn between political economy as a science, whereby laws governing the production and distribution of wealth are formulated, and political economy as an art, using those laws to solve practical problems. Although neither my co-author Malcolm nor I would presume to know much at all about economics, it appears to us that that field, in that field, there's an accepted theoretical core that's been applied to a wide range of areas. But this theory, this core, was developed independently of individual applications. And within the economics profession, there are differing views as to exactly what belongs in the core. In the opinion of many economists, theory building and application must be treated as separate enterprises. In my own experience, nowhere is this view better demonstrated than at MIT where faculty, graduate students, and undergraduates work to apply what they refer to as quote-unquote small models to real-world engineering problems. I recently spent a little over a year at MIT as a visiting professor, and I was consistently struck by my colleagues' hands-on approach to fixing what to me as an outsider appeared to be intractable problems. Economists and engineers were working together designing small, well-defined models to make sense of the world, models to solve very specific issues, and they do just that. The MIT productivity and success rate is astounding. We believe that these examples from economics and engineering may provide a useful roadmap for those of us in the field of creativity. We want to stress that a systems model or unified theory is not unifying if it can't integrate the phenomena and outcomes of the real world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beth. Now we open the floor for questions. Federica, you were jotting down. You have a question? No? OK. Uh, Hi. Um, looking back at some of the stuff that um, people have presented on, on social constructs, and how that affects creativity and, and how we view these things. What I'm curious is if you do come up with this unifying theory or this systems model, at what point do you set up a social construct that then has a bias against any research that might differ from that systems theory or might come from an outside viewpoint? Whoops, are really important um, in many respects. But part and parcel with that, we need to remember why we're engaging in creativity research and theorizing in the first place. There are these real world issues. I've spent my entire career asking how do we set up classrooms so that they're optimally conducive to students' intrinsic motivation and creativity, classrooms at all levels. I'm a former primary school teacher. That's what got me back to graduate school. And throughout my career, studying in graduate school, my, my PhD thesis advisor was Teresa Mabale, who now does all of her work in the area of business creativity. But right from the start, I said to Teresa, when the day comes, or if the day comes, that people ask me to stop thinking about kids and classrooms, I'm out of here. I, I from the very start of my career, have consciously tried to balance this model building, which is very important. This is the way scientific theorizing and research moves forward. Balance that model building with real world concerns. Okay, more questions? If not, we'll thank you again. Thank you.
and move on to the second presentation today, which is by Cristina Dorniak-Wall. She's working on her PhD at the University of uh, South Australia in Adelaide, and she will take us further into this topic of integrating theories. Please, Cristina. Good morning. It's great to be here. So as Beth highlighted, I will be talking about a systems approach to the study of creativity. So to begin with, I'll introduce you to a few of the models that exist, um, and then I'll tell you what I think we should do if we were going to go forward and actually create a systems framework for creativity. So to re-emphasise, why are we looking at an integrated approach? So as highlighted by Professor Hennessy in a previous talk, although there is a vast amount of information on many areas relating to creativity, there is a growing fragmentation in the field and the growing presence of paradoxes and contradictions within the literature. Often researchers in one subfield seem entirely unaware of advances in another. Each approach taken by a researcher concentrates on the issue of creativity differently, devising their own theories, methods and investigative paradigms. In addition, even the definition of creativity has been tackled differently by different researchers in different fields. Baiting and Furnham suggest that the term has been implied in such a diverse manner it ceases to mean anything. So through examining correlates of personality or motivation in isolation, researchers may be producing misleading results that are also unreplicable as the interaction between components relating to person, process and the environment necessary for creativity in different domains is complex and not fully understood. So that's just a list of a few of the different models that exist. For sake of brevity, I'm only going to sort of mention the ones that obviously Beth hasn't, um, and obviously there's many more models than that, but these are the most prominent ones. So the first I'll talk about is the ecological model. So ecological approaches to the study of creativity define creativity as part of an ecological system. Harrington suggests that the creative process, person, and environment are linked in an ecology of creativity. This ecological approach elevates the importance of the habitat and conditions necessary for fostering the growth and maintenance of creative social systems. The main goal of his theory is to bring together three lines of investigation, so characteristics of the person, characteristics of the process, and of the environment. In addition, Harrington has included a development dimension to his ecological model. So he argues that personality um, attitudes, strengths, and skills are often developed over time. Harrington views people who make creative products as functioning within an ecosystem that allows and provides essential ingredients for their creative activity and suggests that people may be in charge of selecting their environment, which he terms niche picking. As well as niche picking, the ecosystem itself may place demands on a person. So for example, in some organisations that require targets to be met, they may not actually give individuals the opportunity to be innovative. So while Harrington's model um, enhances the idea of interactions amongst the environment, processes and individuals, at this stage his research is purely theoretical. As far as we know, there has been no empirical evidence to support his model. An interactionist approach to the study of creativity is um, by Woodman and colleagues. Um, within this model they propose that creativity at the individual level um, is a complex product of a person's knowledge, cognitive style and ability, personality factors, motivation, social influences and contextual influences. So this suggests that although a single facet of creativity may be measured, that no single facet exists without relation to other facets of creativity. So Woodman suggests that his interactionist model of creativity allows the cognitive, personality and social psychology explanations of creativity to be combined into a single unifying perspective. So when used to look at organisational creativity, this model provided a theoretical framework that not only included process, product and person and situation, but allowed um, these to be addressed at both the individual, group and organisational levels. So although this model provides a solid theoretical underpinning of creativity and proposes that different elements of creativity interact with one another, it has not been validated through research and also does not provide any information pertaining to mediating variables. Now the last type of systems approach to the study of creativity I'll be talking to you today is the transactional. So within this paradigm, the individual is dependent upon the environment for creativity. So without a creative environment, a creative individual cannot flourish. 
So the first transactional approach in the field was that of Stein, who views creativity as being composed of processes that occur within the individual and the resultant process of social interactions, thus emphasising processes, personality variables, as well as environmental factors. Stein proposes that there is a transactional relationship between the environment and the individual, whereby one affects the other. Environmental factors play a critical role in blocking or facilitating the creative process, and some individuals may manifest more creativity dependent on the environment. So within, within both processes that occur within the individual and processes that occur within the individual and the environment reside factors that stimulate or block creativity. So therefore, while Stein highlights the importance of looking at person, process and press variables, he does not suggest interactions between all of the four Ps. Stein's experiment did, not pro did provide a link, um, so he's actually conducted some case studies and they actually provided a link between some person and press variables. However, more research is needed. So although this approach is quite, although this approach, um, it doesn't provide a comprehensive view of how all aspects of person and social environment may interact um, to allow for creativity. So therefore, there are a few areas for research which we're going to try and construct a systems model. So a lot of these models have not been fully tested by any empirical evidence. Um, there's not all models look at all aspects of the four Ps, which is something you may have heard earlier, but I'll introduce you to that a bit later. And I also argue that a lot of these are not actually taking a genuine systems approach because they're not looking at the interactions between all elements. So although Woodman's model was quite good, um, there does not appear to be any empirical evidence that looks at all aspects and the interactions. So why is it necessary to look at the four Ps? Since the inception of creativity research, creativity has been thought of and described in terms of the four Ps. Person, product, process and press. And as you can see on the slide, there's a few examples of what that might, the different subheadings might entail. So each component of the four Ps has been favoured differently, um, has been favoured during different decades of the 20th century and has settled into different sub-disciplines of psychology, as well as other areas such as management, human resource and entrepreneurial studies. This monolithic approach is useful in understanding a certain aspect of creativity, such as personality. However, the four Ps do not happen in a vacuum or in isolation. This framework provides researchers within the field a solid basis for investigations into creativity, whereby, although each strand has unique identity academically, only in unity do the four strands operate functionally. So although Rhodes' models initially suggested that all four Ps should be looked at in conjunction with one another, there's only been a handful of research that has attempted to do this. So what exactly is a systems model? The notion of systems approaches to the study of any field have existed since the time of our European philosophy. One such formulation was that of Aristotle. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. It was philosophized that since the fundamental character of the living thing is its organization, the customary investigation of the single parts and processes cannot provide a complete explanation of the vital phenomena. To understand things systemically means to put them into context to, to, to establish their nature of their relationships. Thus, the systems view emphasizes the importance of an organism or living system, uh, or living system are properties of the whole, which arise from the interactions and relationships among the parts. These properties are said to be destroyed when the system is dissected into isolated elements. Von Bertalanthe suggested that a general systems theory would offer an ideal conceptual framework for uni unifying various scientific disciplines that had become isolated and fragmented. Therefore, taking the systems approach to the study of creativity may help alleviate the fragmentation within the field and help provide a more complete explanation of the vital phenomena. Perhaps when attempting to construct a systems framework, another underlying question is, is creativity domain specific or domain general? Sternberg has suggested that it is neither wholly domain specific or domain general. general. Um, similarly, Plucker and Baghetto and Perry and Simonton suggest that creativity is, domain, creativity is predominantly domain specific general, but appears to be domain specific when applied to real world tasks. Um, Kaufman and Beer propose an amusement park theory of creativity. There are some basic levels of factors that are needed for creativity. So general factors, so for example, intelligence, some level of motivation, and an environment supportive of creativity. Um, and then this is followed by domain specific, so for example, engineering or arts, different domains like that, and then micro domain. 
So when we're proposing a model, it's obviously going to be quite difficult, as Professor Hennessy has pointed out. Although it may not be realistically possible to achieve the best model, an understanding of the interactions between aspects of the four Ps would help, un help in understanding how creativity comes in different organisations. The purpose of such a model is to develop a greater understanding of creativity and what may affect it. In terms of practical applications, it may be quite useless and even harmful to make suggestions to an organisation which only take into account, for example, personality aspects of people within the organisation without taking into account other things such as culture. This could lead to discrimination, so people with certain personality types may only be hired, which is you know, not very good because you want a mix of people within an organisation. So I believe an integration would add substantially to our understanding and appreciation of creativity. If we can understand, for instance, what personality types, values, motives in a team, as well as leadership styles and culture interact to lead to successful innovation, we, make, we can make more nuanced proposals and suggestions to businesses. So Professor Hennessy is right to caution against the systems model. It's going to be an extremely difficult task. So you have to make a really good consideration of how to collect all the data needed and what tools are best used to you know, do this. As with most research, it's going to be a case of trial of error until the optimal solution is found. Um, I agree, we need to ensure that a systems model is not all-encompassing. It must remain domain-specific. Until a series of research is done, it should, be, it should sort of remain pertinent to the team or organisation under investigation. So as Beth pointed out, the goal must not be to construct a systems model um, solely for theory's sake. The quest for parsimony must take a back seat to, con to considerations of model usefulness and practical application. Multiple complementary models of creativity rather than a single unifying model of creativity must be constructed. So I just thought, how could we do this? Maybe through the use of structural equation modelling. So structural equation modelling is a collection of statistical techniques that allows a set of relationships between one or more independent variables and one or more dependent variables. So some of the advantages of SEM include when relationships among factors are exa examined, the relationships are free of measurement error because the error has been estimated and removed, leaving only, leaving only common variance. Um, also, reliability of measurement can be accounted for explicitly within that analysis by estimating and removing the measurement error. It can be used to examine complex relationships, and additionally, SEM is the only analysis that allows a complete and simultaneous test of all the relationships. So in conclusion, I think there is a real benefit to constructing the system's framework of creativity. Obviously, it has to be done really cautiously, so we need to make sure it's domain-specific. We need to make sure it's not going to try and account for every single type of creativity out there. So I think it's going to be a very challenging task for researchers, but it's definitely worth it. I think it would take time and effort, but you know, we'll get a closer understanding of how everything interacts with each other. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we open the floor for questions. Please. Microphone. A correlation between creativity and genealogic, genealogic factors. Do creative parents have creative children, or as with giftedness, does it skip a generation? Um, from what I understand of literature, there is both, obviously, you know, environmental factors, so how you're brought up as well as innate. So you can be quite creative if people are continually telling you, no, you can't do that, that's bad, you're being bad, people are not going to actually bring that creativity to the front and actually produce creative solutions. So I think it's a mix of both, definitely. Are the studies that demonstrate this? I believe there are. I, I'll get back to you of any specific ones. I'm not quite sure, sorry, <laughs> off the top of my head. Okay, I have one more question for you. Um, a model, which to me is always fascinating, can be used to describe a process, but it can also be used for practical applications to actually put that in place. What do you think of your proposal? Does it go into one direction or the other or both? Hopefully both. Um, my, research, well, my background is in organisational psychology. So obviously I like looking at organisations and trying to work out how to solve problems within organisations. So I think, as I said, you know, we're just at the beginning of this sort of research. So it's probably going to be theoretical in, to begin with, but eventually we'll be able to make those sort of suggestions to organisations. Um, like I mentioned, you can have either domain specific or domain general. Um, factors that contribute to creativity. So there'll be some that will hopefully sort of 
cover everyone, and then there'll be other ones more specific to a specific organisation. Now, yesterday we had a session on the social aspects of creativity. In a way, we're going back to that topic with uh, Vlad Glaviano because we're talking now about uh, distributed creativity from a cultural psychological perspective. Now, Vlad is a professor at Aalborg University, but also at Paris Descartes, and he's a director or co-director of the International Center for Cultural Psychology of Creativity in Aalborg. So, Vlad, you have the floor. Yeah, um, thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm very happy to be here and uh, to follow the presentations by uh, Beth and Christina. I, I think this um, whole effort of, of questioning whether we need an integrated model, where we need a systems model is exactly what my, my line of thinking has been driving me towards. And uh, my proposal actually is, is not to think of an integrated model per se, model meaning a very specific formulation of how elements interact exactly with each other, but to look at it a bit more broadly and to think about a framework or a paradigm. And this is where the uh, paradigm of distributed creativity hopefully comes into play. So uh, my journey into the, uh, the area of creativity has started with a very simple question. It's simple and, and it's, I would say, misleadingly simple. Where do we look for when we think about creativity? Because as long as we answer this question, we have all the other questions of definition, measurement, potentially impact somewhere in mind. Um, and uh, you can see up there, up top, you can see uh, the decoration of an Easter egg in Romania. This was part of a, a big field work I did for four years uh, back home for me in Romania. But also, uh, we can see a lot of other images of what people might think about when they, they consider creativity. Of course, I, I had the, the image of Albert Einstein. We can easily put Marconi, we can put uh, Marty Cooper or any other people, <laughs> actually any other person here in the audience. So not to be too controversial, I left uh, someone else there. Um, you can look at a classroom context, you can look at a very everyday life uh, kitchen kind of uh, context, or you can think about art and, of course, the very controversial signed urinal. So all of these elements capture something about where we look towards to, to find creativity. And in a, in a survey of, uh, of the literature when I began my, my PhD studies, and of course, being very bold, maybe courageous, uh, maybe too courageous, I, uh, I thought about how we could bring together or, or simplify a bit uh, the whole complexity of the field. And, and for me, what emerged were three main types of, of paradigms, if you were, and I call them the he, the I, and the we paradigm. Of course, this might imply, um, and actually they do come from a kind of a uh, historical trajectory, but what I would like to make people aware of, of course, is that we live in a very complex uh, time and age where these paradigms kind of combine, intertwine with each other. Each of these understandings offers its own definitions, ways of measurement, and of course, has its own very important implications, both theoretical and practical. So just very quickly to um, clarify what I mean. The, the he paradigm is by, de by definition and by excellence, the paradigm of the genius. And uh, I call it the he uh, for two reasons. One is because it's a kind of othering of creativity. Um, in the paradigm of the genius, of course, the geniuses are very few and far between. So it's quite unlikely that uh, a person, individual looking at creativity from these lenses or through these lenses will uh, see himself or herself as a genius. So it's an othering of creativity. Um, it is al also called he because I wanted to point to the ideological construction of creativity. And as we know, for uh, much of the past century and centuries, actually, the figure of the male creator was, uh, was dominant. Um, of course, it has a long historical trajectory from uh, Greek and Roman antiquity to the Renaissance, later on to uh, Romanticism and Enlightenment who contributed uh, to this image. And it is a very much uh, an individualistic understanding of creativity. It locates creativity somewhere inside the person. And we have a lot of examples from genes and heredity, there was a question uh, about that just now, to unique personality patterns, to intellectual eminence, which is the definition of, uh, of genius in modern times, and even forms of, of pathology, of course. Um, while this paradigm, of course, gave us uh, some interesting insight and, and make a clear distinction, helped us kind of locate what is very obvious about creativity and very obviously creative, I would argue that it also led to a lot of exclusivity, a very exclusive elitist view, and a disconnection between the image of the creator and the very broad societal and cultural uh, world uh, in which the creator is immersed. 
Of course, one of the greatest contributions of psychology, uh, and here I, I take a little pride uh, for being a psychologist myself, is the fact that it, it kind of tried to move the paradigm from a he paradigm to an I type of paradigm, uh, in which creativity is very much democratized. Everyone shares this uh, capacity or potential, as um, um, Mark Runko said. Um, in, after the 1950s, of course, um, uh, people working in the field remember, and, and we all kind of go back to refer to Guilford's uh, influential APA address, uh, urging uh, educators and, and colleagues to, to focus on creativity. Of course, there is a very interesting both historical and ideological context in which this transformation happened, but what I would like to uh, argue further here is that although we democratized creativity a little bit, we did very little to actually socialize it. So in a way the focus remained very much on correlates with personality, cognition, and so on. It also encouraged um, what uh, Montori and Purser called uh, methodological reductionism, and others refer to it as well. Trying to be very scientific about creativity, trying to be objective about it, we're gradually reducing the scope or, or the area of creativity until maybe at some point we leave something behind that that is of little interest for people working in applied fields. That's why we have a field of innovation that developed in parallel and, and grew um, broadly, because it, maybe it adopts a broader perspective of what it means to create. Now, the new paradigm, uh, again, going back to what uh, Mark said about the, the changes happening from the 1980s, uh, a shift of perspective uh, taking place more and more. And of course, this kind of work uh, that was contributed to by Teresa Amabile, by Beth, uh, by other uh, scholars, it's, it's developing and it's still not I would say that the leading um, kind of um, a model within the field. But gradually, people move towards complex, constructivistic, systems-oriented um, models. And it is this what I would call the we paradigm, the, the vision of creativity as a social phenomena. Uh, and of course, it is reflected in, in system models that we've, we've been hearing about, and I'm very happy to hear more and more about. Also in research in, on group creativity, collaborative creativity, and more recently in a, in a resurgence of, of what is called the cultural psychology approach. And this is what I'm going to talk about just briefly. Um, I was trained as a cultural psychologist and, and social psychologist. There is a slight difference between the two. Basically, cultural psychology is not cross-cultural psychology. Uh, it is not about uh, different cultures, but it's about culture with a capital C, if you want, how we theorize the meaning of culture. And the cultural psychological perspective, basically, is interested in the, in the interdependence, in an intimate relation between mind and context, uh, in a very broad sense. From a cultural psychological perspective, mental functions, higher mental functions, creativity uh, itself is extended into the world. It is distributed, and there are three types of distribution I will focus on just very briefly in my talk. Between people, between people and objects, and the role of materiality, I feel, has not been fully addressed uh, a lot until now, and uh, across different times. So cultural psychology, uh, to end with, uh, has a lot of different types of focus on meaning making, knowledge construction, uh, activity, and cultural practice. But it, it, in all of them, it is reunited by a, a very much a concern for development, for the progression in time at a socio, social level, ontogenetic, personal level, and microgenetic in, in everyday interaction, moment to moment interaction. So how phenomena unfold in time. So drawing on cultural psychology, but not only, on, on a lot of different other developments that are more or less recent, some from ecological psychology, some advances in cognitive science, and of course the idea of distributed cognition, uh, um, Ed Hutchins, uh, cognition in the wild, and the work of other colleagues uh, comes to mind here. I propose creativity as the following, as a distributed process, first of all, that is simultaneously psychological and social, uh, so, social and material. A situated type of action, uh, shaped differently by, by different contexts, and uh, there was talk about this as well in regards to a unified model. A form of social practice. Uh, what we often tend to forget uh, from a very psychological perspective is that whenever creativity happens, it is embedded within a larger social practice. Even in the case of, of people you know, uh, doing a creativity test, uh, paper and pencil, that is the social practice of testing that people work from within. So what is the broader view, what is the societal trajectory of that very concrete individual act uh, that we refer to? And uh, creativity as a form of cultural participation. Um, uh, Beth was very kind to refer to that paper uh, in which I, um, I, I 
promoted the idea that every act of creativity, even the, the act of a child, is a form of participating in a kind of culture. To understand that, of course, we need to change a bit our idea of culture from a very, you know, uh, capital C, very, very macro perspective to a, min uh, to a more minute understanding. Culture is something that happens interpersonally between people, between groups, uh, and at a societal level. So just because uh, the time is short, I'm going to go through very quickly sociality, materiality, and temporality in relation to creativity theory. First of all, uh, again, maybe in a, in a kind of a static surge, I, uh, I call this slide, creativity is not a thing, but a relationship, or, or rather creativity exists for me at least within a relationship. It is not a thing within the person or within the product or anything like that. Um, if we are to theorize why creativity is social, there are many lines of work we can draw on. First of all, creativity, acts of creativity are rarely individual. And of course, we had uh, here from the panel discussions of how teams are very important for creativity. Oftentimes, creativity takes place in, in, a, in a collaborative setting. But also, other models like Chisen Mihaly's, of course, emphasize how creativity needs to be recognized, validated. There is an element of social recognition into any kind of creative act. So from that perspective as, as well, creativity needs sociality. And finally, of course, there is this idea that maybe our best kind of concepts, ideas, come when we're completely alone. So how do we incorporate that? And there are very interesting developments within dialogicality theory uh, and other, other so sociocultural perspectives that emphasize the fact that we are not a unit, a, a unit as a person that is confined from the social world. We incorporate discourses. Uh, we can think here about Bakhtin's work, for instance. We incorporate others, internalized others that are in dialogue within our mind. So the social is not outside the person. It is very much inside the person. If we uh, adopt this perspective, we have a more clear idea about creativity and sociality. Materiality. Creativity is grounded in the in the material world, uh, world. We need to go back, and of course, uh, Vygotsky is, is one of the key figures of a cultural psychological perspective, but others contributed greatly. If we go back to the developmental history of, of where creativity emerges, and, and uh, there is a great quote by Vygotsky that to understand the phenomena, we need to understand the origin of the phenomena. We can, we can remember that for children, it is in two mediated action during the first instances of symbolic play that creativity takes, pl uh, takes place, emerges. Uh, you know, looking at the broom as if it, were, it was a horse, this is a, a symbolic type of activity, very much supported, mediated by action in the world. So interacting with materials, thinking, remembering, imagining, never take place only inside the head. They're very much dependent on the physical world. And to give a very banal example from memory, of course, uh, uh, how many times, uh, in order not to forget, you made either what people say uh, a note in the handkerchief or, or left something on the doorknob, because that would remind you of an activity. We very much distribute these functions. They're not only inside our head. Or we take notes. That's what we all do right now, right? Um, and finally, of course, there is a very interesting line of research on affordances from ecological psychology, talking about what objects afford a person. Um, for instance, the, this, this table supports, uh, uh, has the affordance of supporting you know, the, the tablet I put on it. Um, it's a very interesting perspective. I don't have a lot of time to get into it, but it actually could reshape the way we think about creativity. Creativity as a way of perceiving new affordances, exploiting existing affordances, and even inventing new affordances. And if you're interested, I'm happy to talk later um, in private about that. Finally, creativity and temporality. Creativity unfolds in time. When we look at creativity only as a moment, uh, only at the, as the moment of insight, only as the idea, we're cutting a lot of the context. Act our analytical lenses are focusing too much on one aspect of it, and, and we're losing sight, as I said, of the very continuous nature of a creative act. So we restrict it to a moment of insight. We look at it in a very static, atemporal almost manner. And that's how, as I said again, innovation people uh, went on and, and elaborated the, the huge theories about implementation. But why should idea generation be divorced from implementation? Um, so acts of creativity have, have a history. That history is both at an individual level, each, of, each one of us has a style, a particular approach and, and uh, um, form of expression, and of course there is a greater social history in which all our individual histories are embedded. We can think about traditions and practices, and uh, my field work with Easter egg decoration actually pointed, to me, pointed very clearly to me this interconnection between innovation and tradition and, and how they um, coexist. 
So um, finally, just to mention uh, Gruber's work and the uh, evolving, uh, evolving systems approaches, very interesting methodologies that can help us articulate a bit of the sociality, materiality, and temporality of creativity, of course, do exist. And now I'm getting to the very bold part of the talk. <laughs> Uh, because I'm, I'm, I recently proposed uh, a rewriting of the four Ps, and uh, yeah, that, that is very courageous. The four Ps have been referred to here quite a lot, and of course they're uh, very much venerated in, in, the, in the discipline, and I'm glad that the work has been done, and, and now we all know that person, pro uh, process, product, and press kind of structure our thinking about creativity. What, from my perspective, I'm, I'm considering is a rewriting of the fundamental language of the discipline could help us actually integrate this model. The fact that we, st we talk about persons, processes, and products unavoidably uh, makes us look at them as distinct realities. How about if you were to use relational terms to, ref uh, to refer to more or less the same reality? Of course, this is a very uh, kind of um, tricky move because when we change a term, we actually bring a lot of social theory or, or a lot of theory within creativity. If we look at person as an actor, we focus not only on internal attributes, but we focus on the person in a societal context. And uh, the fifth P of persuasion is very much integrated into the idea of a person, the creative person, as an actor. Uh, of course, actors call for audiences, which is what I put under press there. If we think of the process, the process that it has been looked at primarily in a cognitive term as a form of action, we articulate, we don't lose anything from the, the psychological, the cognitive, but we coordinate the psychological and the behavioral. And there, there is a lot of uh, excellent action theory being developed in, in cultural psychology. If you look at the product as an artifact, and of course here, you know, people uh, who know anthropology would, would think, okay, but um, artifacts can have different meanings. Artifact is a product of culture, Again, we're changing the lenses uh, through which we consider creativity. And the press factor can be split here between audiences and affordances, between the social and the material, which I think are very, very important. Um, I, I don't want to be just catchy and, of course, offer a perfect uh, alliteration with the five A's. And, and this model definitely needs to grow, to develop, to add more elements, whether they, they have a P in front or an A in front. But the main strive, the main effort for me, was actually to think of how we can integrate the four Ps into a more unitary structure. And from this perspective, as I said, actors imply the existence of audiences, actions necessarily build on affordances. It's a much more integrated, I feel, um, approach. So I'm gonna end with a definition. I didn't begin with one because it's a very long one and, and no one can remember and I don't remember it. Uh, but if we look at the five A's of creativity, we can very broadly talk about creativity as an act in the world, done from the position of a social actor in relation to multiple audiences in ways that exploit existing affordances and generate new artifacts expressive of and integrated into micro and macro cultural systems. And I leave you with this. Thank you very much. And I'm very happy for dialogue about this. Yeah. Thank you very much, Vlad. I will take advantage of my position here and uh, I will give you the floor, but I will start with uh, a question which uh, requires two answers, one from Federico and one from you. So action theory, you, I am very intrigued by bringing action theory into this field, which is a theory that deals with a subject, maybe the actor, and an object, the artifact. And one of the elements of that action theory is that the object, the artifact, has an influence back on the actor. So my question is, of course, Federico invented the microprocessor, but then the, the microprocessor lived a life of its own and, and an influence back on your life. So what was, after the invention, the influence of your invention on yourself? How did that affect your life? And then the question comes to you, what do you think about this feedback from the object onto the subject? Well, f uh, for me, uh, by far, I think it was the influence of uh, internet. The fact that now, with a few keys, keystrokes, I can have access to the knowledge, accumulated knowledge of mankind, practically, and, and that's unbelievable. He, you know, 30 years ago, uh, if I would, if I were to do a research on a par particular subject, it would take me probably several weeks to gather the material necessary to actually uh, do the study and come to some conclusion. Now in matters of hours, I can 
get the information that I need, and that's unbelievable. I mean, it's invaluable. So. Well, I, I can only take notes, actually, <laughs> and, and try to, to consider them. Uh, of course, there is a, a great theory, of, and we can think of sociology and actor network theory, and this brings me to how important it is to interdisciplinary think, uh, thinking uh, of creativity and not only you know, get stuck on the psychological perspective. But it's a very interesting question. I do think that uh, objects can be actors, but I also want to be you know, cautious about because I, I made quite a lot of claims, and of course, there is a lot to discuss what actually does it mean for mind to be distributed and what does it mean really for for uh, objects to be actors my approach is that it is within the relationship that these uh, uh, things happen but uh, then again there are there are many epistemological questions to be answered here I mean I do acknowledge that Thank you very much. thanks uh, I'd like to share with you this possible interpretation of the work uh, we presented um, uh, the uh, paradigms and the following work can be assumed, considered uh, as an attempt uh, to define uh, the dimensions of uh, a creative action. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, if we arrive to have a proper number, a sufficient number of dimensions, at the end we can have uh, a measurement uh, of uh, the creative action. In this sense, uh, I uh, like to add uh, a dimension. Uh, I, I don't find, but uh, perhaps uh, it's present and uh, I, I was not, not able to, to, to find it, uh, the timing of the creative action. Since uh, this is a very important thing in order to see the impact of the real world for example, I don't know if Marconi was less or more creative than Leonardo da Vinci, but certainly the impact in the real world of the creativity of Marconi was very large, and the creativity of Leonardo da Vinci was expressed mainly in the artistic field yeah. and perhaps in the hydraulic, but in, in any case, the impact of Marconi was higher than and no Leonardo, but the creativity of Leonardo perhaps uh, was out of time. Yeah, yeah, no, thank absolutely, you. And, and thank you. That, that brings to the point of how we need to articulate sociality, materiality, and temporality in the same image, because the issue of time also brings us to think about how sociality, social networks are organized, and how material object-person relations are organized within, within a cultural context, a historical context, absolutely. Yeah. I, yes. I'm, I'm looking at this, thank you, and I'm curious what your uh, theory, how it applies to what I called creative potential, mm. and mm. what it might say about the creativity of uh, a child where there's no artifact, or perhaps uh, intrapersonal yeah. creativity of an adult. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I do acknowledge that the piece have grown and actually, you know, they're not only the four and potential is, is definitely one of the, the ones that we need to acknowledge. I think what I would say immediately is that if we add the temporal dimension to all of this, we see the actor as developing and folding in time, not as a, as a final defined product. So maybe that's the key to understand how all these work together to, to, prom to, to generate concrete achievements and how they can generate future achievements. So I would put potentially in the, in the move of the fi uh, five A's into the future in a way, and how audiences construct a notion of potential, how actors come to understand, integrate that and act on it. But, but definitely, yeah, potential would be um, a great thing to think about in terms of the, the five A's, yeah. Thank you. Our fourth speaker today, Andrew Walton, please take the podium. Uh, he teaches uh, MBA classes uh, for University of Nevada in Reno on creativity uh, through the internet from his home in southern Portugal, also a professor of creativity and uh, entrepreneurship at Newport Business School. And he has his own method, which is uh, dubbed as uh, Creative Paths, also a professional jazz flute player. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have always rather liked this phrase. It's, it's to do with discovery, but I think it's equally applicable to creativity, uh, that it consists of seeing what everybody has seen and thinking about and thinking what nobody has thought before. 
Um, I want to just make a slight adjustment uh, f from, from my perspective on the definition of creativity that we were presented with yesterday. Um, and I'm going to say creativity occurs when people generate ideas that change their world. Um, my granddaughter is now five years old and I've been watching her grow up. Um, every day she has a thought that leads to an action which is a little bit different than before. In other words, every day she thinks something or has a, uh, generates an idea that changes her world. Now, to me, that is not a trivial function. That means everybody was creative. The process of growing up and learning becomes creative. It is inherently creative. So I'm saying that we were, everybody is creative. I'm not saying we're all equally creative. Thus, when studying creativity, maybe we need to recognize it as a social phenomenon first. Understand that before we turn the microscope on individuals. Because over the last 100, 150 years that people have been studying creativity from the individually based perspective, we have really recovered, uncovered remarkably little. Things like, we need to be motivated. Well, anybody eminent, whether they're creative or not, needs to get up in the morning. So, really, the, the, the individual study of creativity, I don't believe, has been terribly successful. And maybe we will end up studying what suppresses creativity. Why our 0, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 year old suddenly becomes, or, or becomes in the course of socialization, not so creative. Humans are a mass of contradictions. We spend our lives having certain goals and taking actions that do not appear to be moving in that direction. There is a particular contradiction that I want to focus on right now. We have, all human beings have a, a major need for connectedness with others. We need to be part of groups. Maybe you'll share with us a few of the groups that you belong to. Uh, family, university, <laughs> friends, hopefully. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Would you share with us some of your groups? Uh, professional colleagues, um, animals. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you very much. That's the penalty for sitting in front, by the way. Okay. So we have family, we have work, we have friends, school, church, recreation, just a few. And I'm sure you can add at least a thousand more. One of the things that happens when people are put in a situation of fear is that they tend to become much closer to their groups. They t tend to identify more with their in-groups. And after the, the terror of September 11, 2001, uh, millions of US flags started to appear on people's porches, on their car antennae. And that was a clear indication that people were associating more carefully, more closely with the group, their nation. Okay, so groups can be very, very small. They can be just two people. Um, or in fact, they can be millions of people. Most, nearly all of whom we don't know. Um, they can perhaps be the 2,000 friends that one of my students claims to have on Facebook. So these can all be our in-groups. So when we're associating with our in-groups in any way, whatever, it is our similarity with others that becomes important to us. That's the salient issue. And that comes from connectedness. And these are not trivial. I mean, our, our group memberships are absolutely vital. If you deprive people of their ability to have group memberships, they will not remain stable for very long. This is solitary confinement, probably one of the worst of all punishments that you can dole out to somebody. Maslow considered uh, the importance of the, this group connection as second only to our need for food and water. So, in amongst this mass of contradictions, we have also got the need to be, to, be, to be and to be seen to be unique, to have our own degree of novelty. I am not a, f a number, I'm a free man. 
And the inability to demonstrate uniqueness also has negative consequences for well-being. The display of uniqueness is, of course, the display of our creativity. This is the area where creativity comes from. Um, in fact, Otto Rank, uh, back in the 1800s, considered that, this, that our, our display of creativity, this display of uniqueness, was also um, a, a, an attempt to gain immortality. But in this particular case, it's not our similarity with others that we're focusing on, it is our difference from others. Now, these are two opposing drives, and they cannot happen simultaneously. We cannot have salient our difference from others and our, our, our similarity with others at the same time. So, I consider this to be one end of a continuum. I mean, they may not be quite the same dimension, but for all intents and purposes, I believe that we have the need for group affiliation, our similarity to others at one end, and then we have the need to display our uniqueness. This is the difference from others at the other end. The implications from this um, are that we have to depart from the comfort of the group in order to have to maximize our creative potential. Any force that's in the direction of connectedness is the force against the motivation to create. I mentioned uh, the horrors of 9-11 a little bit earlier. There is quite a bit of evidence that overall on a global kind of, well, not a global basis, but within the US, creativity actually went down after 9-11. This was as related to various different um, experiments that went on in the States and also archival work. Um, there's clear implications for this theory with regard to the current trend for teams. Team building, as you know, has been the buzzword of the, the business profession for, for 20, 30 years. And there is also evidence that creativity in an organizational setting has not been improved by the use of teams. Innovation, yes. Actual generation of novel ideas, not so much. And of course, brainstorming. Brainstorming is inherently the way it is traditionally performed, a team activity. And the fathers of brainstorming, um, not just Osborne and Parnes, but the people that came after that, um, put a lot of effort into trying to discover why a group of people sent off to, to, to ideate individually would come up with more unique ideas than when they sat around a table to do it in a brainstorming format. And that research, although people try and find excuses why it, it wasn't quite right, that has been conducted in the East, in the West, in large groups, in small groups, and it seems to be um, really a, a, a very uh, a result which is difficult to disprove. So in this particular situation, if you take on board and, and you appreciate the, the notion of not being able to be unique um, at the same time as, as uh, being as part of a group, it gives you some idea of perhaps why a brainstorming as a group is not terribly effective. So all is not lost. I mean, I'm not team bashing by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and neither am I trying to, um, try, trying to ditch brainstorming as, a, as an extraordinarily useful tool. But what needs to happen, I think, is that within uh, the notion of brainstorming or teamwork, there has to be space for individual activity. And now, when I conduct brainstorming sessions, the actual ideation portion of the brainstorming, I have people disappear in all different directions, not even in the same room as other people. So successful innovation requires both the space for individuality and the facility to cooperate as a team. And unfortunately, in the profession or domain that we work in, there really isn't any consensus with regard to creativity um, and, and innovation or inventiveness. There are all sorts of different ways in which these words are used. So 
in my book, creativity is, is the generation of a unique novel idea. I personally am not even concerned about its usefulness at this point. It's generated by a single individual. And this is generally the point where I have to duck because parts of the breakfast table are generally thrown at me at this point. Um, I sincerely believe that although a lot, of, a lot of positive creative outcomes can come from teams, that the individual germ is an individually based thing. The individual unique idea comes from somebody. So when everyone's sitting around a table with their own little ideas, somebody will say, yes, that's mine, yes, yes, yes. Now, they, by the time you get to the end of the process, these ideas, you may not be able to identify who came up with the original germ, but that doesn't matter. We're not, we're not awarding prizes here. That germ came from an individual. And my belief, um, and I'll just talk very briefly about the studies that I've done on this, is that that um, original germ will stand a better chance of being unique if it is generated by an individual in relative isolation. Um, so innovation is what happens after that creative germ is born. And that's really where you need all the skills. And, and you may also get, it may be an iterative process. There may be a lot of creativity in the development from the initial germ to the, the final result. Uh, oh, by the way, um, I, at the bottom of the last slide, um, I put in, oh, I seem to have lost it. Um, requires skills such as interpersonal communication. Okay, that's something that I don't think is discussed in the world of creativity and innovation nearly enough. The world is replete with engineers with great ideas who are unable to discuss them in a convincing and fluid fashion um, in such that anybody listens to them. I used to be an engineer before a psychologist, by the way, so I, ha I have seen that in practice. Uh, I'm not going to discuss the, the, the studies in detail. Um, Mark was kind enough to publish one of these uh, relatively recently. Um, but I'm very happy to send people copies of, of uh, um, my, my, my work that led to this. Um, in the studies, I uh, vary a number of different fa factors. Um, these are basically group organizational kind of settings. It's ex the, the ones I'm describing are experimental, although I have done some field work also. Uh, one of the things I, I vary is collectivist versus individualist norms within the groups. Because the principle is, if you have um, a group, an organization, the norms of which are individualist, in other words, the, the individual is expected to strive for their own personal benefit rather than the benefit of the group. The idea would be that you are then tempting people to the left-hand side of my continuum. In other words, you're not connecting them with the group, you're connecting them with their own personal interest. So, um, and by the way, um, yes, yeah, so collectivist versus individualist. I also um, varied threat. Uh, so one group was under threat, competitive threat. If they didn't get the job done, their company might not be there tomorrow um, or not under competitive threat. Um, I controlled for affect. In other words, I, me I measured people's well-being in the course of all this. Um, and I did analyze by gender for various reasons. I won't bore you with just at the moment. Um, what I found was that organizational norms do shape the level of creativity of individuals within that organization. So individualist organizations did produce a significantly higher degree of novel creativity than organizations that had a more collectivist approach. Um, positive affect is associated with positive creativity. This, in all my studies, this came through as a significant factor. So let's all be happy and we'll be more creative. Uh, an emphasis on individuality helps increase creative output in general, despite the overall uh, organizational norm. Um, under competitive threat, the salience of the problem solution to survival may be critical. This is a little bit to one side of what I'm talking about, but basically, um, if your organization is under threat and people are aware that what they're doing might mitigate that threat, 
in other words, they're totally aware what they're working on might help the company survive, then they will be more creative. If, however, you give them a problem that is nothing to do, or you don't tell them that it's anything to do with the survival of the organization, then the threat will suppress the creativity. They will be less creative. So that there are several models that I also won't bore you with as to what, what might potentially happen um, to creativity under threat. But that's what I found happened in practice. So basically, if you're really struggling and you need people to be creative for the survival of the company, you need to let them know that. Um, communication regards the importance of the focus of the creativity um, may be critical. So, um, further thoughts, um, I mentioned this very briefly before, uh, I have people come together for the problem identification, um, I send people apart for the individual brainstorming, we regroup for idea sharing, uh, and this may be an iterative process. So, even when we're using teams, for, especially for product development, but anyway, we need to leave plenty of room for individual creative contributions. Uh, Toyota, by, by the way, is very good at that. Um, in loose teams, we need to emphasize group goals. Um, we need to keep focused on the direct and positive contribution of creative products and maintain positive affect. Okay? If you are interested, I've got... Uh, um, just published a book which has a lot more information in it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Around, please. Yes. Andrew, yeah, very, uh, very good uh, talk. I just wanted to focus on one aspect uh, that you mentioned. I think Mark will probably support us on this. Um, in terms of a methodology for the teaching um, of creativity, a traditional education we can sort of argue tends to be based on the notion that you know you, you start with an empty vessel, you fill it up with knowledge and skills. Creativity uh, education, from my point of view, and I think from your point of view, is that uh, you work on the assumption that the potential is there and uh, a lot of the practice is based on removing the inhibitors and it's a very distinct and different approach. And I think uh, something that we can maybe discuss further. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think the... Um, the corporate culture goes much further than individuality or, or, collect, or collectivism. Um, it's got to include, if you're talking about an organizational level, but even in any group level, it has to include the fact that it's okay to make mistakes, and it also has to include the fact that we're going to positively um, and, and verbally stress the importance of creativity so people know that what they're doing when they're being creative is actually important. Absolutely, good point. Okay, another question here from Gabriele. Quick comment, a quick question. Comment. If you look at the history of Guglielmo Marconi, you can find good examples of what you said about the different moments of the creativity. When it is more important, the individual part, and when it is more important, the collective part of the process. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, question. Uh, I found... Uh, similarity between what you said and uh, the theory of Kuhn about uh, the scientific revolutions. When there is a moment where we change the paradigm and this is a moment of the big creativity and then the period of the normal uh, development of the science, which in, the, in your world can be the period of the innovation. In the first part, uh, there is uh, the individual and the creative act at the, at the best level and in the second part the collective work uh, where uh, the, the development is uh, due to a collective action of the scientific community. What do you think about that? I think, I'm not sure I, I totally understood, but um, I think the role, the role of the individual um, versus the group has changed dramatically over history. So sometimes I think historical comparisons have been, um, can be a little bit difficult. I mean, when earlier on, when, when Leonardo da Vinci was mentioned um, and, and the difference perhaps between his impact and that of Marconi, 
Um, that's probably more of a, of a, of a chronological anomaly, a, a temporal anomaly, in, in the sense that um, now the demands on innovators is, is often much, much greater than it used to be in the past. It's, it's more, uh, in the past, an individual could probably take an idea to an innovation place on their own or with a very small team. I mean, now, if you were looking at um, the cell phone, for instance, you know, you have so many different, you have the idea, but then you have so many different skill bases, you know, from materials, from electronics, from um, radio transmission, all, you know, so many different inputs that you need in order to make that work. But, um, but I, th I think in, in principle what you're saying is absolutely right, though. Okay, one more question here. Your, your, observation, your observation that this unit stress increases creativity uh, is certainly true. Prisons have great creativity operating within the inmate community. And I was just wondering if you thought that creating stress within groups might be constructive. Um, I think there are many examples where that's the case. Um, the, the, the most powerful example I can think of is, is uh, the, the stress caused by war. Um, during the Second World War, we had the evolution of radar, the atomic bomb, of course, uh, the jet aircraft. Um, all these things, at least at the innovation level, rather than perhaps the original germ of the idea, their, their, their generation was, was, was accelerated dramatically by the stress of, of the, uh, the, the occasion. Now, whether or not, if you go back to the original kind of generation of the innovative germ, whether stress has a positive impact on that, I don't know. Okay, there are more questions. You'll have to take them offline. Uh, so thank you again. <laughs> we move on to the last presentation this morning, which will be delivered by Sergio, Sergio Agnoli. Uh, he received a PhD from the University of Ferrara, and I have the pleasure to say he is the number one researcher in the Maikoni Institute for Creativity, so, and also the technical chairman of this conference. So. I will introduce the speech uh, um, by saying that we want you to take home something practical. And one thing that I think we all agree on is that to have a new idea or to be an inventor, you have to have an open mind. We all agree on that. But what does it mean to have an open mind? Why is it that so often in the history of science and art, Something strange comes in, something unexpected comes in, and only one person is able to notice that and take that further. Is that something which happens by chance, or is that something that is systematic? And can we measure that? Can we build experiments? A general theoretical approach, but some uh, practical data, as uh, Giovanni explained, uh, on the functioning of the individual creative thinking process. In particular, I will uh, ex uh, expose as, uh, uh, the, some personality traits, in particular openness to experience, is related to uh, creativity. And we made this uh, exploration using an eye movement analysis. So, uh, everyone of us knows that uh, there are uh, huge differences in creativity, or better, in the expression of the creative potential. Uh, there is a research file in the um, creativity study that explores what are the individual differences in the expression of creativity. And this kind of research try not to categorize the personality in uh, uh, high creativity person and low creativity person, but try through the understanding of the individual differences to explain what are the mechanisms at the basis of the creative thinking process. So our research can be uh, described 
inside a, a theoretical model that is the uh, big five theoretical model that postulates that personality can be described with five generally uh, general criteria uh, personality trait that are openness uh, openness is the appreciation for art for uh, for adventure or having curiosity and uh, uh, experience a variety of experiences then there is a conscious a conscientiousness that is the aim for achievement for example the extraversion is feeling positive emotions or is sociability the agreeableness is the tendency to be compassionate or to be cooperative and the neuroticism that is uh, generally speaking uh, uh, the emotional stability or emotional instability as you can see from this uh, uh, representation this figure a person cannot be described only with one personality trait but is the sum is the result of all these uh, uh, five personality traits one person can be high in openness but can be also high in uh, conscientiousness or in extraversion and at the same time, another person can be high in eroticism and uh, agreeableness and low in, in the other traits. So personality is the result of all these uh, personality traits. The uh, creativity research in particular uh, showed us that one personality trait is uh, related to a higher level of divergent thinking, that is openness openness to experience. And in particular, when we measure divergent thinking use, uh, using some unusual uses, uh, some divergent test, uh, such as the uh, unusual uses test. Uh, this test uh, ask person to uh, thinking uh, of as many um, unusual uses of a, a common object, such as a, a, a brick, and then measure this, uh, the outcome uh, measuring the fluency of uh, the uses produced, uh, the originality uh, thanks to independent raters that uh, rated the originality or the frequency of uh, occurrence of uh, uh, some uses. So the hypothesis uh, that uh, the literature present to explain uh, the association between openness and creativity is that uh, openness is associated to a uh, uh, reduced cognitive inhibition, that is to less selective filters to, to irrelevant stimuli. Uh, according to this uh, hypothesis, more inputs enter conscientiousness, enter awareness, and these inputs are more likely to be combined to form uh, new ideas. Uh, our question, our research question was, how can we measure the information retrieving, the information processing during a creative uh, process? So we try to answer this, this question using an eye tracker methodology. Uh, the notion at the basis of this methodology is that there is not, uh, no appreciable leg, leg between what is fixed by the eye and what is processed cognitively processed. Uh, in particular, this methodology uh, can measure all the movement of the eyes, and in particular can measure the processing of a space, of the space. As you can see from the, uh, the, the right picture, uh, you can see here the different fixation area of, uh, of the eyes that is the different cognitive processing of different areas in this picture. So for using this, uh, this uh, kind of methodology, we uh, develop a, a new uh, version of the unusual users test, that is a visual version of this test. What we made is to uh, put, put in the center of a screen a common object, and we ask to the participants uh, we um, involved in the, in the, in the, in the study 30, uh, 30 participants of the University of Padua, 30 students. Uh, we put in the center of our screen a common object and we ask the participant to produce as many possible uses for this object. 
but we uh, put uh, uh, all, uh, um, all around this object other object, but this object was apparently irrelevant to the task we ask the, the participant. We ask to find the uses only for the central stimulu, stimulus. Then using the uh, eye tracker software, we set different uh, area of interest uh, where we measure the length of fixation, the length of uh, processing, uh, and the number of fixation in this area. We put uh, an area in for the central object and eight different areas for the uh, irrelevant objects. So the, the procedure, we, we gave uh, uh, the instruction where uh, we uh, ask participant to produce uses only for the uh, object in the center of the screen. Uh, after the instruction, follow uh, uh, a fixation point that uh, lasted uh, 500 milliseconds. After, after this fixation point, in the correspondence of the fixation cross, appear the target object. They, uh, the participant can look at this, uh, uh, at this uh, figure as, uh, uh, as much time as they want. After this uh, visualization, this uh, observation, they space uh, the space bar and they uh, made a production of uses for 30 uh, seconds. This uh, uh, sequence repeated for, uh, five times, one block, and we have three blocks for a total of 15 observations. At the end of the, uh, this computer task, the participant filled up two questionnaires. One questionnaire, uh, one in uh, inventory, measure the personality trait the five personality traits uh, hypothesized in the big five uh, model, that is the neo five-factor inventory. And another questionnaire was the uh, creative achievement questionnaire that measured the creative achievement in different areas. Uh, we can obtain from this questionnaire two main scores, that is the uh, uh, creative achievement in the artistic domain and the in the scientific domain but we can also obtain a global score, and in this study we use uh, the global score. Our hypothesis so, uh, was that openness was related uh, to a higher level of creative achievement, but also with high level of users production, in particular to higher fluency, to higher originality, and to lower fr uh, frequency use. Uh, in the same time, we hypothesized that uh, the length of observation of irrelevant object uh, was associated to, also in this case, to creative, uh, uh, a higher creative achievement uh, to higher production of, uh, of different uses. So, a uh, first, uh, uh, first set of results showed that Obviously, and this was an uh, uh, effect of the task, the uh, participants look longer for uh, um, much time to the target object. They were asked to, to produce the user for this target, target object in respect to the irre irrelevant object. Some correlation analysis. Uh, so you can uh, find in, uh, in blue the negative association and green the positive association. What we found is that openness was positively associated, significantly positively associated to observation of irrelevant objects. So higher the uh, openness of a participant, longer the observation of uh, irrelevant object. Uh, on the contrary, openness was negatively associated to observation of uh, the target object, the, the, the uh, convergent object. Um, what we, we, we found wo was also that the observation length of target object was negatively correlated to observation length of irrelevant object. But more interesting, we, we found that the observation of a relevant object 
was associated to higher level of creative achievements. Uh, then we found some uh, results that are uh, consistent with the literature, uh, such as the fluency was associated with the originality and frequency uh, of uses was negatively associated with the frequency, uh, fluency. So to explore, to go more, more in depth with this result, we ran uh, a, a series of other analysis, some uh, hierarchical multiple uh, regression, and we found that openness was not a, a, a direct uh, predictor of uh, uh, creative achievement. Uh, the observ but the observation of irrelevant object was a, was a good predictor, uh, explained a good portion of variance of the creative achievement. But more interesting, we found a, a interrelation between creative, uh, the observation of irrelevant op, uh, object and openness. Uh, we made a, moderator, uh, a moderation analysis and we found that the level of openness was a moderator between the relation between uh, looking at irrelevant stimuli and the creative achievement. In particular, uh, when we have when the participant had a higher level of uh, openness and a higher level, uh, they look longer to irrelevant stimuli, they had the higher level of creative achievement. This is in line with, uh, with our hypothesis. So, I go faster. Uh, a second uh, order of uh, analysis explored the originality. In this case, we found that fluency was a good predictor of uh, uh, um, cr uh, originality, and is, that is consistent with that in literature. But we found, also in this case, an interaction between the, uh, with, uh, with looking to the uh, irrelevant stimuli. Uh, here, the most interesting result is that uh, at low and medium level of observation of irrelevant stimuli, the fluency had an effect of on, uh, fluency had uh, an effect on originality. But when participant looked longer to irrelevant stimuli, the fluency was totally irrelevant, was not significant. So, concluding, we uh, found uh, or we uh, hope to having found. The, the central mechanism that uh, relate openness to creative thinking, that is the processing of if, uh, irrelevant information associated to the processing of irrelevant information, we found higher level of creative achievement and higher originality scores. So, uh, the, the information retrieving is one of the uh, principal stages of mental or mental states of the creative thinking process. We can distinguish between some convergent information that is uh, the, conver the conventional knowledge, the state of the art, the expertise, and this convergent information is always available and uh, it depends on all the knowledge and culture, culture processed by the in individual. But we have a second modality, a second kind of information, the divergent information, what is not uh, directly relevant for the problem, what is not correct uh, according to the current th uh, theories, what is absurd of, uh, or provocative. One of the distinguishing elements of the creative thinking process we think, uh, we think is the uh, divergent information. This result demonstrated also that some individual differences exist in the ability of handling with divergent or relevant information. So, as a, a take-home message, I can uh, suggest you to look at irrelevant. You can also think inside the box, but at least look at outside, uh, outside the box. Thank you, Sergio. So just to round up this presentation, you need 99% conventional information, just a little, little, little bit of 
irrelevant or divergent or something that comes from the outside, which could be the reason why working in a team is good, some other opinion, or looking, noticing the details is important. All of these little elements, only a little bit changes the result. Any questions from you, please, Andrew. Would you think it could be then that uh, the same people who feel comfortable looking uh, in the periphery, the, the, the so-called irrelevant information, have an inherent capacity to look at many different factors before they uh, focus on what it is that they're really doing? And could that possibly lead to this higher degree of, of, of diversity in what they're seeing and what they're thinking? Yes, for sure there is a, a, a relation between the capacity to look to the diversity, but uh, it's also always to say that uh, we, we uh, using the eye tracker methodology, can always measure some micro uh, phenomenon. Uh, for sure we had to expand uh, our result, exploring uh, mm, or creativity uh, with uh, more um, sophisticated uh, task than the uh, unusual users test. In this case, we can uh, task if the different uh, uh, way to look at the world can influence also the production of creativity ideas. Sergio. So when people have a tendency to look at these irrelevant things, do you see them also as valuing them differently, as having a possibility to help them with their thought process, whereas someone else might focus on that center object that's so important and be hyper-focused on it in order to do the task? So if I'm looking with my eyes at those objects, am I not mirroring the same thing I do in my mind when I allow myself to think of things that are seemingly irrelevant, but might be the spark that take yeah. me to where I want to go. Yeah, that, that, that is the, pro, uh, the, the, the process, yeah. the basis of uh, this uh, result. Yes, uh, um, I think uh, that uh, um, we, we uh, can uh, insert in our methodology, for example, the evaluation by the individual, by the participant, of their own uh, uh, ideas. Uh, is, this, uh, is, this is a uh, procedure that uh, is, is used when, uh, uh, for example, the person, the, the participants, uh, produce different uses for, of, of a common object. They judge the two more creative ideas. Maybe we can uh, uh, found uh, an association between the value, the values given to their own ideas and uh, the observation of uh, irrelevant stimuli. Okay. Uh, I want to tie in with the uh, previous presentations on the dichotomy between groups, individuals, and constructivist and objectivist. Yeah. How can you be so sure which one of the objects are irre irrelevant? I could I could see a lot of good uses for the hammer uh, yes, inside yes. the hanger and yes, this is the question because it's it, you defining what is irrelevant. I mean yes, uh, I think uh, it, it was the the the, the objects were irrelevant for the task for the task and uh, but they are apparently irrelevant. They can be combined with the common object. This is uh, the uh, ability we measure, the ability to combine objects. Uh, we measure this kind of, of uh, th there is uh, people that cannot combine different kind of information. They have their uh, knowledge, their expertise, and they cannot look outside, uh, make connection between things. In this result, we found that there is a difference in the ability to use the information of the space and to process the information of the space. This is the basic result, I, I guess. 
Yeah, we agree with you in the sense that you would say look at the irrelevant because nothing is irrelevant. Yeah. You can use anything and anything works. So with that, I want to thank you really for this morning session. Thank you to Federico and the 2013 Young Scholars. We will close now and for lunch start sharp at 2 o'clock. I'm still missing three CVs for the first afternoon session. So Roberta, Giulia, Elisabetta, please give them to me. Have a good lunch. See you at 2 o'clock.